Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, Lando Links live webinar on Bus Back Better. I'm Jenny Martin. I'm the Secretary General of ITS United Kingdom, the independent association for everybody in the UK who works in transport technology. So I hope there are some uh, members out there in the in the rather large audience. Uh, GDPR, of course, means that I don't know who you are, but I hope you're there. We have an excellent panel for you today. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll really enjoy the talks. We will deal with the questions and the comments after the four presenters have had their say, but please keep your questions coming and please use the questions facility for that, not the chat. Please use the chat for communicating anything else, links you want to share and uh, doing a bit of networking, but please use the, the questions for the actual questions that I need to put to the panel. So without further ado, because it's more interesting to hear from the speakers than to hear from me, I'll hand over to our first speaker, who is Neil Davis from Atkins. He's their senior bus and rail planning specialist, and he'll kick us off by talking about navigating the requirements of the national bus strategy. Neil, the uh, screen is yours. Thank you, Jenny, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to briefly take you through some of the requirements of the MBS this morning, um, and I'll be broadening uh, on the content of my slides as we go through. So bus back, next slide, thank you. Bus back better sets out bold ambitions for what the government wants to revitalise bus network to deliver, building on the funding changes put in place during the pandemic and the challenges resulting from it. It sets a consistent framework for bus service planning and delivery across England and outside London and wants to change to a virtuous circle of improvement. Reading beyond the document statements and case studies, it appears there's a gap between the MBS's ambitions and what is likely to be delivered. So far, we've seen no mention of new primary or secondary supporting legislation, so the document makes significant use of would like, should, aspire and expect. A month on from the launch, we've had the opportunity to digest its contents and ambitions. The clock is ticking and we should now be several steps down the path of starting discussions between authorities and operators. As work progresses on producing the evidence base and determining future aspirations, we must keep in mind that transport is a facilitator. It's rarely the product consumers want in its own right. Deliver them the right bus network and they will use it, perhaps with the odd stick such as parking restraint used as well for encouragement. We need to continue shifting approaches towards evidence-based planning, which when coupled with easy to understand services and fares, removes many barriers to using public transport. Taking forward the aspirations, we must, however, temper ambitions with reality. Changes to patronage numbers and travel patterns, both evidenced in the short term and unknown in the longer future, will have major impacts on the network that is needed. Wider financial matters across all aspects of the industry, such as abilities to raise match funding requirements or determining whole life cost and finance models, will most likely be different to how they were only a year or so ago. The MBS includes four key dates. <clears throat> The £100,000 payment with an application deadline of this Friday is intended to start building capacity and capabilities within each local transport authority to support the ongoing commitment to monitoring, review and updating the enhanced partnership. Initial support may be from external sources to start the process of the baseline analysis, but government is expecting to see each LTA develop in-house skills and knowledge for the longer term. By the 30th of June, a direct declaration is required that an enhanced partnership or statutory processes for franchising will be adopted. The required detail of this statement will be set out in the forthcoming NBS guidance. The 31st of October sh should see the publication of draft bus service improvement plans by every LTA, with this then following due process to be enacted by the end of April 2022. Very much simplified, this slide shows the broad processes to be followed in establishing an enhanced partnership. A series of feedback loops can be noted, which may cause delays if key stakeholder groups aren't brought into the EP development flow at appropriate junctures. It's important to remember that the NBS provides several warnings about the level of involvement and detail of BSIPs, raising the potential loss of downstream funding if it is deemed that LTAs are not being ambitious enough. Again, information on the required level of detail will be set out in the forthcoming guidance, but it is clear that the government is expecting LTAs to deliver more than the bare minimum. Next slide, please. 
enhanced partnership guidance developing on from the previous slide is set out here showing interactions between the tiers of the working group partnership board and wider oversight and governance with significant with significant discussions and negotiations to be undertaken with multiple stakeholders, it is clear that gateway dates should be established very quickly to set the time available for analysis tasks and document drafting to ensure that reviews and approvals are achieved in a timely manner. There's a lot of bouncing between the different tiers. So, what does an enhanced partnership actually entail and how does it become a bus service improvement plan? As you may know, an EP comprises two parts, the plan, which is the high level strategic document, and the scheme or schemes which sit under the plan and specify the measures, facilities and other obligations on the LTA and operators. They're generally for a single authority's operator uh, area, but can be cross-boundary if that better reflects geographies. From the MBS document, the bus service improvement plan will seemingly wrap both the EP plan and scheme into a single document. Guidance on enhanced partnerships was updated in February this year. Perhaps it should have given us a teaser as to what was coming in March. The EP plan sets out broad objectives of the bus network, which should be aligned with other policy documents such as local transport plan. It presents the baseline analysis undertaken, identifying major problem locations and sets out where the improvements are needed, whether this is network expansion to support development locations or changes to better reflect other external influences. The plan should set out how the current services meet or fall short of ex identified expectations and the financial support that the LTA is providing for subsidised services, listing route numbers and route mileage supported. The MBS says that targets should be set for journey times and reliability improvements for the LTA as a whole and in each of the largest cities and towns in its areas, and these are to be reported against publicly at least every six months. When setting objectives and targets, be fair to all parties. EPs are legally binding and therefore the targets and monitoring should be equally shared. Be careful not to hold yourselves captive to unachievable targets. Drawing on experience of monitoring and evaluation plans for local schemes, the EP should minimise the need for additional data collection, perhaps beyond passenger satisfaction surveys, which may not previously have been undertaken for local uses. As set out in the partnership guidance, EPs can be revoked and or varied. Under the EBS, uh, MBS, it is assumed that the full revocation will be deemed an action of last resort, but variation is likely to be required as funding availability and other factors change. Moving on to the EP scheme, the MBS sets several broad areas for consideration. The aspired standardisation of services stems from the ambition that an easily understood network is more attractive to potential users. Data from multiple sources can help with this network planning evidence. Traffic counts, mobile phone data, workplace travel plans and the like can all be used to determine what changes may better support local communities. BSIP should detail plans for ensuring that connectivity is maximised, though timetable coordinate through timetable coordination for bus bus and bus rail interchange, but this desire for closer integration mustn't be at the expense of existing convenience. We shouldn't forget the lessons of the past, but also mustn't set the network in stone. Forced interchange may well reduce the attractiveness of the wider network. This is an opportunity for consideration of wider reshaping of not just the bus network, but potentially improved access to other local services as well. For example, with mobility hubs at key locations. If some trends seen during the pandemic continue, such as people working remotely, there may be an opportunity to provide accessible service to office facilities more locally. In rural areas, pulsed service networks may offer improved connectivity and reduced interchange waiting times. Priority measures will be identified as part of the network planning process and most likely have an iterative, iterative element to finalising service patterns. Analysing available data, including more detailed investigation once routes are confirmed, will identify specific issues and help to shape the development of interventions. The MBS strongly encourages LTAs to be bold and courageous in their bus journey time improvement decisions. It is suggested that consideration be given to diverting general traffic onto other routes. To provide space for bus priority measures. Implications are made <clears throat> that other tools to support the sustainable travel agenda, such as low traffic neighbourhoods, can also be used to gen reduce general traffic levels and help improve bus uh, journey time reliability. Deliverability will be a factor. Consideration must be given to the length of time required to consult on priority proposals. 
The involvement of the EP board in discussions with wider member group will help to gain consensus on interventions and broaden support and speed approvals. Iterations of network priority and development locations to maximise public transport and active mode travel choices will support alignment of measures with objectives in the EP plan and other policy documents. Guidance on the criteria for BRT towns and cities is awaited, but planning systematic priority measures on multiple corridors in an urban area will not be wasted effort. Fares policy is the element of the MBS with the largest gap between ambition and delivery with the tools available. The aspiration for flat fares in the urban areas is bold, but in practice, how would this work whilst retaining the ability of operators to set their own fares? There is a need to balance commercial considerations of affordability against, for example, concessionary fares reimbursement. No changes will be made to funding for disabled, pensioners and home school transport, and no central funding will be provided for discretionary enhancements, such as older people below the state pension age or unaccompanied children. New multi-operator ticketing schemes sitting on top of operators' own products are encouraged to be at or only marginally above the price of single operator products. <clears throat> Opportunities exist for LTAs to push the take up of account based ticketing, which might avoid some of the current issues with bank card fare capping on multi operator networks. However, it may be possible to effect capping more quickly if all operators happen to be using the same brand of ticket machine. Smaller operators may welcome the involvement of the LTA to support acquiring the same equipment to bring these capping benefits. On a simpler, quicker basis, an initial step might be exploring if operators would be willing to adopt mutual acceptance of each other's day tickets. The government support to link capping across ticketing platforms, initially between bus operators, but longer term bringing in other public transport tickets is welcome, but with no timescales given, one wonders whether this will be achieved within the five years of the strategy. The passenger charter should be tied to the plan's objectives and targets, setting out what passengers can expect from the bus network and the broad obligations of authorities, operators and the passengers themselves. What other elements are included will be part of EP negotiations, but should be passenger centric and mirror the wider ambitions of the BSIP. Part of the government's focus on sustainable transport, over the five years of the strategy, the MBS sets out to plan 4,000 zero emission buses out of an English non-London fleet of approximately 23,000. There is a need to manage local expectations about viability and deliverability, along with supply chain capacity. A pragmatic approach must be taken as to where first tranches of vehicles are implement, implemented, perhaps focused on air quality management areas. More practically, there are serious considerations of funding. Operator contributions are required, but caution is noted as to current whole life costs, such as replacement batteries and major parts. Battery buses are a maturing technology, but hydrogen buses are very expensive and still in early stages of second generation of development. Hydrogen fueling infrastructure is also expensive and has major planning and delivery considerations. Operators are looking for certainty around the whole funding package. Comments have been heard regarding the disparity between Scottish and English kilometer or passenger payments. It is hoped the anticipated reform of BSOG will be tailored to support the wider MBS objectives, but again, no further details are yet known. We await the guidance. Fleet investment and infrastructure delivery timescales must be considered when drawing together the EP scheme, so as not to put unachievable obligations on any party. This is where the EP variation process may be necessary if significant delays arise, which could jeopardise targets being met. The scheme delivery will also have resource impacts within the LTAs and operators, and so should be scoped and appropriate actions taken. Again, drawing on wider experience within authorities, a strong programme delivery team may be beneficial in keeping projects moving forward and ensuring any deviation is notified in good time by appropriate governance channels. So in summary, the theme of collaboration runs throughout the MBS. <clears throat> so please respect what each party brings to the discussion. Listen to what your stakeholders suggest, but be clear to them that there is no blank check to reintroduce 10 pence flat fares or three minute frequencies on every route. <clears throat> Budgets are under pressure on all sides, particularly local authority funding and operator revenues. So you need to respect conversations about affordability and deliverability. Changes to operating funding models due to zero emission fleet investment 
may mean that service viability is change. Hydrogen buses are expensive and the full life cost of electric vehicles are still being worked through. But still the LTAs and operators want and need to be ambitious. A passenger focused network is the main objective. So push, push each other to deliver this. <clears throat> Remember the warnings about delivering, delivering strong BSIPs and the potential impact on subsequent wider transport funding if they're not deemed ambitious enough. And finally, if you haven't already done so, as a local transport authority, don't forget to apply for your £100,000 funding by this Friday. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much, uh, Neil. That, that sounds like very good advice at the end there. And thank you very much for setting the scene for us so well. Uh, I've had a, a few questions come in for Neil. So as we said earlier, I'll keep them and we will uh, go through the questions at the end. Uh, a couple of additional points of housekeeping which have arisen. If you have problems with, with your audio, uh, the advice is to uh, restart, you know, come out of the webinar and restart it. And if that fails, come right out and restart your, your, uh, your device from scratch and re-enter the webinar and hopefully that will solve it. If it doesn't, please let us know in the chat and uh, keep those questions coming please so next up is uh, simon lusby from city science he he's their head of transport planning and he's going to talk to us about planning your routes to bus back better and simon over to you uh, thanks jenny um hi yeah so um i'm from um, city science um city science is a small uh, software development transport planning and energy company uh, we were founded out of the need to decarbonize. So everything we do is around how do we take transport, energy, places um, to decarbonize. Uh, next slide, Mark. So that just summarizes it there a little bit. We're looking across the whole spectrum, but that overarching piece is how do we um, fix the climate. Next slide. So I have a little bit of background in bus. Um, the main thing was that uh, I was recently at TfL as the bus, um, or as the public transport strategy manager there, um, firstly for service and then for um, all public transport. Um, but as you'll have seen in the in the national strategy, um, although bus is mentioned about, I oh, sorry, London is mentioned about um, 44 times, um, the majority of that is actually in um, um, the prime minister's intro, and then also talking about outside of London or the fares and the electric vehicles. So we're talking very different pieces here, but I, what I'm hoping I can do is give a bit of this um, perspective from what's going on within London and what we might be able to gauge from that and, and my wider experience within that. Next slide, thanks. So, um, I mean, Neil really gave this a really good introduction. I think uh, that was great. So what I'm gonna mainly be focusing on here, are, um, the skills and people to deliver the strategy and the bus priority schemes and other elements um, within that. So that's going to be the focus of this. Next slide, thanks. Now, the um, a bus service improvement plan looks to cover quite a few different things. Um, really, when you see there, it's covering a lot. And what I'm going to try and do is uh, simplify this down a little bit to about nine points and um, talk a lot around the collaboration, who this is actually for. Um, next slide, thanks. So what I've done is I've just split the um, uh, bus evidence improvement plan into five pieces here. So the number one thing coming out of this webinar or anything else is go and talk to your decision makers. Go and tell the managers within your organization that um, uh, any um, support groups that you've got and things around um, what that this bus strategy exists and that it's important to get onto it now um, because there is a very tight time frame on this to get things out by October. Then reach out to your operators. So we need to make sure that they, they, them and other delivery partners are on board as soon as possible because they're gonna be the ones actually operating buses. So, and that's gonna be one of the key elements there. But also um, your passenger groups and other, other groups like those that they're at least partnered up front. And then the next element, which is what this presentation is gonna cover a lot of, is establish a local vision um, with those decision makers, with those partners, so that it's all agreed up front. And as you'll see, that needs to be more than just bus. And then collate a, a solid evidence base to actually support that, which is um, really key to this, that it's not just lines on a map, although how much fun that is. Um, and then obviously produce an evidence delivery plan. Next slide, thanks. So 
I think the key thing is when we're talking about bus back better, um, who's that actually for? And the key word that's in every single one of those boxes is it's for people. So it's it's whether it's the people who it's their essential journeys that it's supporting, it's they want to clean a planet, they just want to see less cars on the road and safer environment. If they're going to be cycling in those spaces or they want to get see space returned back, the most efficient way for us to do that is to move as many people who are traveling onto buses or other public transport so that there's less cars on the road, so that there's less emissions coming out, so that there's the, the streets are just, just safer and nicer to be on. So there's a whole piece around this, but really that's the key thing. This is all actually for the bus passengers, not just for the not just for buses. Um so people will benefit most from, from better buses. And without this actually be being delivered, what we could just see is car the reliance on car for few and um, no mobility choices for the many. So um, it's really about getting that uh, equilibrium around that as well. Uh, next slide, thanks. So I think one key thing to look at is the um, local cycling walking implementation plan. It sets out a clear structure for how to do an implementation plan there. And it's worthwhile taking that into consideration when, when starting up your approach. So the particular things is setting a clear scope at the start, conducting intensive um, and open engagement, um, building an evidence into everything you're doing, collaboratively making the networks, although as Neil pointed out, they need to be um, financially viable, and then prioritizing the, the right service patterns and then actually making a roadmap to how that will be delivered and who will be delivering it. Next slide, thanks. Um, the other is to then set that vision, as I was talking about. Um, this is just something we've done for Oxfordshire Infrastructure Strategy. Um, so it sets out that it needs to be more than just about making buses reliable. It's about how do we achieve cleaner air? How do we reduce congestion or have fewer cars? How do we make streets safer? Um, deliver healthy lifestyles um, and also um, better community cohesion. So that's where Bus Back Better has wider outcomes than just, just bus. The bus can deliver those things. Next slide, thanks. And then what we see here is you might, some people might call it carrot and stick, but I like to call it, call it incentive and cost, that um, we can't allow car to keep increasing. Um, I mean, we just can't because the space, the emissions and everything else alongside that. So we need more efficient approaches. And you can see that, that bus has been deteriorating in terms of um, patronage. So what we need to do is flip that cost and really draw out the true cost of, of driving. So um, tying that in with um, better parking charges, better congestion charging, um, or actually having congestion charging, um, and reinvest that and ring fence that to actually make buses better, because there's going to need to be money returning back into the system from things as well as bears. And then also there's a massive reallocation of road space that needs to happen from car to bus to, re as I say, make that road space more efficient. Um, we don't need to go, I'm sure the audience doesn't need to hear about how many people fit on a bus compared to um, one car um, or five cars but um and then you can see there that when there was true investment going on within tfl into the bus network particularly around the king livingston you can see that bus patronage really rose within london and um so that shows that true investment in it can really deliver that next slide thanks um and then undertake um detailed trip analysis so because using that trip analysis, you can work out, will it be flexible for where the growth is going to be in the future? Um, will it be financially viable? Are there going to be enough people actually taking those services? Um, how do you create core spines that can then be truly financially viable while, and then they can support your connectivity type routes? You need to identify where are the, um, a good word I heard recently was anchors. Where are your anchors of demand? Where are the places which are really driving, driving up demand? Like might be universities or schools or it could be a shopping facility but you don't necessarily know that without delving into the detail and just connecting up town centers isn't going to achieve that you need to actually work out where are the trips coming from and where they're going to um and then also making sure that you're supporting diverse trips so or um and diverse users so different times of day different trip purposes different different, different willingness to pay different lengths of trips and you need to make sure that all of that is being considered, not just the commute. Next slide, thanks. And then we want to be getting true insights out of what we're seeing. So when we were doing some recent work for the RTPI, we found that 40% that 
you needed about 40% bus mode share within the UK to deliver decarbonisation, was what we were finding for a lot of these UK places. And so that sort of an insight is quite handy to be able to say, okay, well, how do we translate that and reinforce that back into what we're doing? So to do that, and I think Neil covered this quite nicely as well, was that we need some quality data. We need then people who can analyse that data because it is quite a hefty amount of data. And then we need multi, multidisciplinary reviews and interpretations of that. So from an energy point of view, um, if we're going to uh, move everything to electric buses, for example, we need to know, can the grid actually cope with that? Um, then we need to display that in insightful visual, visualizations, not just maps, but also uh, tables, um, graphs, and other things that, that non-technical people can actually interpret and make decisions around. And then we need to also, as I said, work out where those key drivers of demand are coming from. So, um, and one, one thing I um, just drawing on one of my own quotes was that if, if we've got all these low emission buses, they're not much use if they're then stuck in traffic. So that's why we need that reliability element tied into it as well. Next slide, thanks. So, and then we need quality bus lanes. Um, this is from the Mayor's Transport Strategy, which I helped, um, helped build that side of it. And what we were looking for there was to try and get true buy-in on where bus priority really needed to be, particularly in central London, where there was a, a key need, and then bus rapid transit type corridors around outer London to, to deliver connectivity between rail lines. And so it needs to form a co cohesive network that people can actually buy into. Um, it needs to be continuous. So it, it, your bus lanes actually need to go through junctions, that they need to pass hotspots. It can't just be they stop at a hotspot. It's like a cycle facility stopping at an accident area. It's just, it's just pointless. Um, and they need to be properly enforced, have support by traffic signals, and also be prioritised for bus passengers and for emergency services, which means they need to be going as many hours a day as possibly can and be clear, um, not uh, constrained, like I said, at unclear junctions where there's traffic blocking them. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, and then we need to think about multimodal integration. So better buses can lead to quite a few different outcomes here. So less traffic, better air, safer roads. I'm literally just reading off the side here, but you see what I'm saying. It's you know, a nicer, you don't necessarily think about this, but it can create, better buses could create a nicer space to cycle because there's a lot less cars in that space and it's a lot cleaner a space. Um, so when, and when we think about that, there's all the, all the point about the timetabling as well and where you actually put your bus stops and things like that. But it's also around having a cohesive network. Um, so, so that when you look at a, an LC whip or anything else like, like any other networks that you're proposing, they actually integrate quite nicely. And that's, that's I think, key. Um, next slide, thanks. Oh, sorry, and I, I, I meant to say just there as well. If it's gonna have all of those outcomes, you have to be able to prove it. You have to be able to evidence it. And that's the key, the key thing there is evidencing all those wider benefits. Um, the other thing is to bring in your bus drivers, your, your um, bus garage staff, uh, and of, of course your passengers as well. But these people are the ones who are gonna know where the issues are on the network and what you're trying to do. Data can only take you so far. True insights from staff who are actually doing this day to day is key. Next slide, thanks. And then a key bit there as well is value for money. So there are going to need to be some direct high quality services and they're gonna be the ones that um, are truly going to cater for the higher demand and are gonna be the most viable. And so we need to make sure that we build those in so that those can actually generate revenue and help to support the rest of your network. So there needs to be a key element around there of value of money. And you can see that on the, the chart I showed earlier around patronage, where bus patronage started to decline as investment in the London network started to decline. And so we need to make sure that what we're planning here is going to be able to, to sustain itself beyond this um, the bus back bit of funding. Um, and so that really needs to be planned into it. We can't just build giant networks. We need to be thinking, how do we actually make something that's viable long term? Next slide, thanks. And so I think the key thing here is to really go back to that point around spread the word. Let the, the decision makers know that this is going on and make sure that they're on board now. They're going to be the most, them and your, um, your other key stakeholders around governance are going to be your key, your, your key players in this. If you don't get them on board early, sorry about the pun, but if they're not on board, then, then you're going to get to a point where you end up with these schemes that just aren't deliverable or you end up with a clash between different modes. 
um, and that's not going to really help anyone. Um, next slide, thanks. <coughs> um, and then just a quick pitch from us. We've so we have software that you may have seen on some of these slides um, that can help to provide some of these insights. We're happy to support that, and we're happy to provide some workshops on it. So um, please get in touch if you'd like to to undertake a collaborative workshop around what needs to be in your bus service improvement plan. Like I said, our main thing is we just want to see some um, the decarbonisation in places within the UK, and those workshops will be totally free um, for local authorities. Um, next slide. Right. So that's all. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I am so impressed by the speakers so far, keeping so brilliantly to time. Uh, if this continues, we'll have ample time for our questions, which will be great. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your interesting presentation and thank you for your attention to timekeeping. And uh, thank you for, you mentioned uh, the issue of skills and capabilities. I think maybe some some people on this call will, like me, remember the uh, the DFT funding for real-time passenger information. We, we're going back about 20 years now. And one of the challenges in, in spending that money was actually enough people in the UK with the, cap the technical capabilities to rolling that out. So it, it's an ongoing issue and it's something I think we, we can all help in our own small ways. And I, we, we'll take, we should take the cue from Simon as a reminder that uh, Bringing on the, pe the people behind us is something we should all be doing for, for the good of the country and everybody. So next up is uh, Carl Partridge, who is the CEO of Urban Things. And so this is a topic ev even closer to my heart than the previous two, the role of technology in Bus Back Better. So Carl, over to you. Look forward to your, your presentation. Thanks very much, Jenny. And uh, thanks to everybody at Land Links for having us today as well. And one of the most exciting things is I feel like I can play the part of Chris Whitty today because I get to say the immortal phrase to Mark behind the scenes. Next slide, please. Yes, there we go. And as if by magic. Thank you very much. And for those of you that haven't heard of Urban Things, we're a UK based SME. Uh, we were one of the very first companies around 10 years ago to start using smartphone and app based technology to transform passenger travel. Uh, we were the original publishers of an app called Bus Checker, which grew to become the UK's largest independent bus times app. And I, I was very directly involved with that. So I'm, I'm, I kind of have some really exciting emotions when I see the Bus Back Better strategy. I've seen buses go through a cycle of growth and then decline in this country and renewed interest. And it genuinely is exciting to be here today discussing how we can put them right at the center of the UK's public transport strategy. Now, next slide, please. I won't get tired of saying that. So um, my presentation today is entitled Bus Tech Better. Uh, and over on the right is the clear reason why the DFT won't be hiring me as their graphic designer anytime soon. And as Jenny says, I'm gonna be talking about the role of technology in the national bus strategy. Uh, what are the options to meet the objectives and what are the dangers to be aware of? Uh, next slide, please. So it is indisputable that to meet the needs and requirements of this ambitious strategy, we're going to need to leverage technology. Uh, some of the key objectives listed here, everything from fair modernization through to multimodal integrations and demand responsive services. A lot of things that uh, that Neil was talking about in his presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So choosing the right technology, I don't think anyone would disagree. It, it is hard. Uh, I mean, look how stressed out this man in the stock photograph is. He is literally tearing out his lockdown hair. Um, we're, we're being asked to commit as local authorities and LTAs in writing to targets backed by technologies that underpin not one but multiple complex requirements and this requires a good understanding of the options which contactless card model should we choose the strategy is quite light on detail which back office do you need an app for your new strong local brand uh, how do you get your app to talk to everyone else's what data should you be using what format 
Uh, will BODS, the new bus app and data service, be acceptable? How do you store your passenger data? Is it GDPR compliant? So what I'm going to do today is, is review some of the options available to cities and operators to deliver some of these requirements and hopefully provide some insight into their relative strengths and weaknesses. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with one of the more obvious ones uh, and the more talked about, fare modernization. There's a huge amount in the strategy setting out requirements to modernize fares. Uh, contactless payments are pretty much mandated as a commitment to move, as is also a commitment to move to daily capping. Uh, I thought what was quite striking about the strategy document as well is it, uh, it particularly calls out smart cards as something that the government thinks has had its day. We're going to see smart cars decline. The strategy is fairly clear on that. We're all in on contactless, which is fine. Contactless bank card technology is, is revolutionary. It's absolutely great. But choosing contactless bank cards on their own comes with a few risks and, and may not meet all of those longer term requirements. Uh, London has shown that they're great for anonymous travel with capping, but that's in a self-contained ecosystem with a single transport authority, effectively a single operator really, and flat fares. So what happens when you start to try and deliver those other longer term commitments too? The strategy calls for multi-operator ticketing, multi-operator capping, integrated multimodal ticket ticketing. And, and at this point, anonymous plastic bank cards don't scale so well. So there are various options to tackle this. Um, they all have relative strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the first option, you might want to try and integrate all the different back offices. You could build a large centralised back office to handle the capping of all these payments. If somebody taps their bank card on a rail journey, then they tap it on several bus operators. And it is technically possible. It's, it's a complicated approach, uh, something Transport for the North tried to procure a couple of years ago and, and didn't end very well at that time. Getting multiple back offices to talk to each other is hard work, and it can also lock you into particular suppliers. A second option is to ask people to register their bank cards. Uh, you'll need some form of user interface for that, uh, either a smartphone app or a website. Uh, obviously, that presents a bit of additional friction for passengers. They have to actually go and do something, um, but you can offer incentives for passengers to register, such as reduced fares or, or even the capping itself. Perhaps the simplest approach is mobile. Um, these days, it's extremely easy to set up an account on a mobile app. You can log in with Google with one tap of your finger, log in with Apple, or even log in with Government Gateway. There's no reason why login has to be complex, why accounts can't exist in multiple places to protect data. And at this point, with option three, you're not relying on a credit card number to link people to their journeys. And you get all the other benefits that mobile can offer as well. The ability to talk to your passengers, to have that strong local brand for your transport, to promote your transport services, and of course, easy off-bus payments. So there are strengths and weaknesses of all the approaches there. Multi-operator fare apportionment is also not an easy problem to solve. If somebody makes five journeys on one bus operator, then another journey on another one or a rail journey, and then their fare gets capped, how should that money be apportioned? What are the rules in place? And how do you make sure that you've got the data to enforce those rules? And these are the things we need to be thinking about now while we're setting up these enhanced partnerships, because if there are dependencies such as data that we need, exciting part two, everybody. Um, what a thrill. <laughs> uh, I was in the middle of a very long involved slide about fair modernization. I, I, I won't go back through it all although I don't quite know when we got disconnected, but um, please do reach out to me if you need more information on this topic. And we were just, we talked about capping and whether contactless cards and they can only take you so far. And we were just starting to talk about pay-as-you-go travel. And um, we have an option for what is called check-in, be out as well at Urban Things. And that's a, a way of using Bluetooth beacons so that we can automatically tap passengers out so you can avoid those dwell times where everyone's jostling for position trying to tap out particularly if the bus has only got one door at the front 
So we, we have some good resources comparing these different approaches. Uh, please feel free to reach out uh, and drop one of us a, a line here at Urban Things if you'd like to, uh, to continue that discussion. Next slide, please. So the strategy makes it clear that bus services need to be more discoverable. Uh, both scheduled and real-time data need to be available to passengers. Uh, it goes into great detail about plastering those all over bus stops, uh, but we also need to get this in a digital format to a tech-savvy audience. I'm sure most people are aware of the Bus Open Data Service, a fantastic initiative, uh, and that can take us, to a certain extent, that can take us so far now. That makes timetables data widely available uh, and vehicle position data. Uh, at the moment, what it doesn't do is link those together for you to generate those predicted arrival times. So you will need a tech supplier with a predictions engine. Um, often that could be the ticket machine manufacturer or the AVL manufacturer, um, Urban Things. We have a prediction engine as well uh, that will link that data and generate those predicted arrival times at bus stops for passengers. So that's your basic live information. I would suggest you consider supplementing that with occupancy information, live information on predicted capacity levels to show people how busy a service is, uh, particularly as we're trying to encourage passengers back onto public transport, thinking about social distancing requirements. Uh, we, we actually worked with Innovate UK to generate what we call an occupancy predictions engine as well. So we also have the ability to say not how busy the bus is now, when it's 10 stops away, but let's try telling the passenger how busy the bus is going to be when they want to get on the bus at their stop. So we do have that capability uh, here to use technology for that purpose. Uh, also consider multimodal journey planning, uh, tempting to outsource that to the market, maybe one of the large American app companies or phone companies. Uh, that's certainly a cheap approach, very cost effective, uh, i.e. it's free. Uh, but equally, there are weaknesses attached to, to not, having your only not having your own journey planner. Uh, the main one would be the lack of data that you're actually gathering as to where your passengers, your citizens want to go and how they want to travel. And you're very unlikely to strike any sort of deal with that large American company to get that data back. I can speak from experience here. And finally, let's not forget the role of design and great maps. Uh, there are great companies out there doing fantastic work developing visual bus guides, spider web diagrams. They're all great. Let's make sure those are available digitally and as widely published as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, it's great to see the government referring to marketing and promotion and indicating that money can be bid for marketing activities. Uh, you can have the best transport system in the world, but if nobody knows about it, then what's the point? So let's make sure we bake that into our plans. And the tech sector has actually involved incredible marketing techniques. Uh, they've all evolved over the last 10 years, starting with targeted advertising. And these are all, these are all technologies we can leverage for public transport marketing too. A uh, couple to call out uh, targeted marketing. For example, you, you could be dropping flyers in car parks to get people out their cars onto buses, those flyers could have QR codes on to download an app. You could then target, um, you could then track the conversion of those campaigns and you can improve those campaigns. These are all great uses of technology for marketing purposes to incentivize modal shift. And making sure you have an account-based approach. Again, coming back to the anonymous bank cards, if you've just got anonymous contactless out there, it's gonna be very hard to give out coupons to incentivize travel, make sure they can only be used once per person, loyalty schemes, all of those things require some form of account-based central system. Uh, next slide, please. And then I, I bundled up the last couple. The, the strategy has this glorious vision of multimodal, multi-operator, demand-responsive transport. I, I think Neil made the very good point that, that we're not sure really whether or not that's, that's gonna happen in the next few years. It's not a firm commitment. But right now, to have one ticket across multiple operators and modes, efficient transport, right now that is impossible. And if you move to the next slide, it's blocked by the fact that we don't have a city's data in one single place. We have all the data we need, 
but it's siloed and fragmented. We have supply data about bus fleets, electric scooters, rental bikes, where they are, how full they are. All that data now exists. We have demand data, where people are requesting to plan a journey, where they're tapping on and off vehicles, what their commute setup is on their favorite app. But until we get that data in one place, until we reconnect cities to transport, we can't use that in a coherent manner to tailor our transport supply to meet demand. Uh, next slide, please. This is how we see things linking up. In my opinion, the long-term viability of public transport is going to be about centralizing that data. We have all the jigsaw pieces, we need to connect them together. And cities, once they put a mobility hub in place, they can start getting access to all of that data that I was talking about. Uh, this is an example of the Urban Things Mobility Hub, how we're able to take transport data, supply data, journey planning data, and make that available to cities. Next slide, please. So I think that enhanced partnerships, was that, sorry, Jenny, was that yourself? I heard something on the audio. I wasn't sure whether somebody was telling me I was, I'm short on time. I wouldn't dare do that call after what just happened. You carry on. <laughs> okay, I've only got a few more slides to go. Um, enhanced partnerships could be crucial to getting the data you need. This could be a once in a generation opportunity to actually put everything in one place. And this data sharing that I'm talking about could be baked into an EP. We can share that trend and that demand data. And that doesn't mean putting operators at a commercial disadvantage. That could be shared back with them. We don't need to fight over the data ownership. It can all be done anonymously and securely. But without good data, without that holistic view of supply and demand, we cannot meet these key requirements of the Bus Back Better strategy. We cannot move to mass. We cannot move to DRT. I'm going to be very interested that the strategy talks about the government's forthcoming mobility as a service code of practice. We're going to be looking uh, very carefully, looking for that and examining that. Next slide, please. I'd like to finish with a short case study because a lot of this might seem quite abstract or airy-fairy, but this is happening right now. A good example would be our project with the Government of Wales this year, uh, where Urban Things has delivered a mobility hub for the national bus network. And that's across six different operators, 13 different routes, and it provides that central place for multi-operator ticketing, it provides that strong local branding to tie everything together, and it provides that passenger information. We've delivered a passenger app. There's a driver app as well to allow reservations on fixed services. There's a passenger website for people without smartphones, and then there is that central portal for the city to gather that data. And what we need to be doing is extending these out to additional modes of transport, additional payment methods, uh, eventually allowing us to move to a mobility as a service. Next slide, please. That's pretty much it from me, just to say, similar to the last presenter, we're very happy to help. We have got this expertise to serve all the stakeholders that we've built up over the last 10 years, from passengers in bus checker to transport providers and lately cities and governments. So we're happy to offer a free consultation on your bus service improvement plan. Uh, we'd love to help you shape that technical strategy hopefully try and uh, avoid some of those pitfalls in making those longer term choices and mapping out that journey to mobility as a service. Next slide, please. And uh, that's pretty much it from me. I, I would very much look forward to speaking with those of you who are interested in uh, talking more about the strategy and what you can do, but uh, passing back to Jenny now. And thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Carl, and thank you for dealing so well with the online equivalent of a, of a fire drill. Uh, you kept <laughs> it cool admirably. <laughs> it, it, it was, of course, entirely my fault because uh, I, I was you know, congratulating everybody on how well we were keeping the time. So if anyone's to blame, it's me. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> OK, so we, we, without further ado, uh, now on to our, our final presentation which is from uh, Claire Walters, who's the Chief Executive of Bus Users UK. And I think it's, it's a really good place to end because it's all about the actual uses of the services. Uh, Claire's talk title is the National Bus Strategy, What Will It Mean for Passengers? 
Claire, over to you, and I'm not going to say a word about how well it's all going. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Um, if you could put the first slide up, please. Um, that's where, where I'm coming from today, for obvious reasons. Um, and isn't it nice to be talking about buses as a strategic priority for a change? It does, um, does seem it's been the Cinderella service for a long time. Next slide, please. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Along with plenty of other people and organisations, Bus Users has been clamouring for a strategy like this for many, many years. So we start from a point of welcome um, and relief that it finally got off the drawing board after a few false starts. Um, much of the bus doesn't ever seem to grab the headlines. Um, all our lives would be much the poorer without them, even those who don't actually use them on a daily basis. And if you don't, how dare you? Um, but at least this point in your life, you might not be using them, but believe me, that day will come for all of us at some point. Um, the social role that buses play really can't be overstated. Uh, it connects us all to everything we need. And if the bus wasn't around, we'd have a lot more cars on the road, pollution in the air and nowhere to go for the 40% of Brits, 40% of us, catch a bus every week just to talk to another human being. I bet they've had a miserable lockdown. We don't often talk about buses as a tool against loneliness and social exclusion, but research shows it really is an effective one. Um, again, it's not something we tend to talk about much, but young people are the hardest hit when buses go missing. They're the means whereby young people mostly manage their lives and get about independently. Those of you who are currently acting as mum and dad taxis might want to think about that, by the way. Um, they're also the main way in which they get to the educational outlet of their choice. So if the buses aren't there, it makes life harder for people to follow the course or career that they want. Next slide, please. One of the interesting things about the strategy is it's trying to address the old fashioned image of bus travel, wanting to make it cool. Now, whether politicians are ever likely to succeed in making something cool is a matter for another day. And anyone who saw Rishi Sunak's attempt to engage with young people by talking about himself as a massive coke addict will know exactly what I mean. It doesn't often work. However, one of the main things it really wants to address is the reliability concerns of people who don't often use the bus and encourage the bus passengers that were there before COVID back to the bus and to get non-users to try bus travel, which is in itself a worthwhile ambition. Clearly, the government's levelling up and decarbonisation agendas are important factors in trying to ensure the bus industry gets back on its feet as soon as possible. And it's also really nice to see a nod, as mentioned by some of the other speakers, to transport hubs and integration in the strategy. These are things that something else that we and our partners in the Sustainable Transport Alliance have been calling for in the past few years. Next slide, please. So what are we being promised? Um, frequency, inclusivity, bus priority, all these kinds of things that we've been asked for, the integration, the ticketing, all that kind of stuff is what we need to know, um, but it actually also needs to have easier and smarter ticketing is great as long as you don't forget the hundreds of thousands of people in this country that don't have access to a smartphone, a bank account, a, let alone a contactless one. So we do need to be a bit cautious about saying technology will solve everything. Unfortunately, not everyone's got access to technology. Um, obviously, low affairs is something that uh, everybody wants. It's not necessarily financially that easy to achieve, but it is something that everybody complains about, everybody looks at, all that kind of stuff. Um, and greener vehicles, obviously, key if we're going to get a, a less polluted air for our future generations to breathe. 
Um, next slide, please. So what we need to look at then, it's not just um, where we're going, it's where we've been. Because obviously we've had a huge period of negativity, um, a long period of austerity, cutting lots of subsidies and removing a huge number of experienced transport planners from local authorities. And these are the agencies, the local authorities, that are supposed to be waving this particular magic wand. Government messaging during the, the last year suggested pretty much that any form of public transport was almost guaranteed to give you COVID, which must have been a great comfort to key workers. And they also told people to travel or not to travel unless you have to travel. So it's been a very confusing time in terms of the messaging around public transport. Um, and that's going to be quite hard to overcome. Um, the long-standing inequality um, of service between urban and rural areas and a complete inability often to change service and subsidy provision when work habits or life habits change in the community. Imagine being a 16-year-old with a job at McDonald's in the nearest town. It starts at 5 a.m. or it finishes at 11 p.m. or later. Trying to be sure you get a bus in to your work and home again. How do any cities give you that option, let alone rural areas? Almost none do that. The budget for all this, lest we forget, is three billion pounds. Next slide, please. That's not a lot of money. It sounds a lot. Don't get me wrong. It's nice that it's specific money for buses. But when you realise it translates to about 250 million per authority, and then you take into account that a green double-decker bus costs around a quarter of a million, it's not going to stretch. It's going to be very, very difficult to get everything we need to look at. And also, you may notice that the buses that are available under the Green Bus Fund are standard double-deckers and single-deckers, which again, if you're in an awkward part of town where people park all over the shop and you need a hopper bus, or you're in a rural area and you need a really small bus, you can't get it under the new bus fund. So I think the budget might need to be looked at again. Um, the requirements to engage uh, with local communities for local authorities and the planning and services. We all know most local authorities just don't have the staff or they're not very good at this or they haven't got the experience in house to do this right now and right now is when they're going to need to do it um oh and obviously as everybody said they've got to commit to either being part of an enhanced partnership scheme or a franchising program um in order to ensure access to that money um and never mind applying for for the capacity building money by the end of this week They've got to do all that by October. That's going to be great fun for authorities that are currently in powder for local elections in May. How's that going to work? I don't really know. And then if they do end up with a big change of, of leadership, they're going to have an awful lot of new councillors to train up and get them on board and then get all the, the meetings in place in order to get all these things approved. I, I, I don't really understand quite how that's um, feasible in lots of places. As an organisation concerned with ensuring communities get access to their decision makers, how are we going to ensure that the needs of communities don't get swamped by the panic to just get any sort of funding proposal together and sent in? Next slide, please. So, We've already had some very clear presentations about the requirements. Um, I think it's it's difficult to see how any of these things are going to be done um, by the councillors who are presumably wiping the sweat from their brows and picking up all the stuff they threw on the floor when they saw yet another list of new responsibilities. Um, so they've got the bus service improvement plan to do. Now it's very clear that that needs to be Put together in concert with local communities, local passengers, people who are actually going to be on the bus. 
passengers are part of this picture, but it's not that straightforward to get at those passengers, especially at the moment. So the BSIP, the Bus Service Improvement Plan, um, has to be a collaborative affair. Um, we've got to have a bus charter. Now, we've had bus charters for quite a long time, um, and obviously there's lots of different ones, but at least there's some around to be able to pick off a shelf and then start tailoring. You also need a bus advisory board to hold people to account when um, the, the offer is not met. Um, now, that's not as straightforward as it sounds either. I'm not going to talk about the local centre of excellence to train all the local staff in the skills they need to do these jobs. It's, it's not something I think I can get into just now. It's a whole different board game. Um, and would like to know where they're going to find these people to train, but okay, we'll get there. Next slide, please. So, you can't actually meet the three main requirements from a passenger perspective without really good quality community engagement. It's just not possible. And we know this because we've been doing this for 35 years. There are lots of other organisations out there which have detailed knowledge of their local areas and the needs of the people in them. It tends not to be the people that turn up to public meetings in council buildings. It just doesn't tend to be those people who always come, always turn out, always have the same complaint. All the organisations around, the community organisations in your locality and the national ones that have been talking about this stuff forever, we're all here to help these local transport authorities get it right. We've written to every local transport authority in the country now, um, trying to help them work out a way to engage with their local community in a sensible fashion that actually gives them what they need so that they do end up with a plan that makes sense for their locality. I do think there is a problem um, that could be coming up. Next slide, please. There are going to be people, well-meaning and some very skilled, who are going to be offering off-the-shelf plans and the authority will grab on to some of these things in order to risk, not risk, losing the money. Um, the trouble is that, that that will commit them, that plan, to an awful lot of things which may have zero bearing on what their local communities actually want. So it's really difficult. It, the improvement plan really has to be based on what your local people actually want, the feedback that you gather in a sensible and proportionate fashion so that local people can actually feel the benefit when it happens rather than wondering what all the fuss was about when nothing's changed. The charter itself, that needs to actually be a living, useful document, not just some downloaded Google Doc. It has to be something that makes sense and is owned by your communities. The advisory boards also need to not be made up of just a few volunteers, army or otherwise. It needs to actually reflect all the communities that you've got or have a voice, an authentic voice of the communities that you serve. From a passenger perspective, this is a huge opportunity to make sustainable transport an option for everyone. We cannot and must not let it slip past. Last slide, please. If bus users can do anything to help, we're ready, we're set up, we know how to do this stuff. Please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, I think that's the that's the perfect. Uh, uh, tone and content to, to end uh, the, the formal uh, presentations with, uh, reminding us uh, why and on whose behalf we, we are actually working. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I would like to point out that uh, the uh, what I called our uh, fire drill was actually uh, a general go-to webinar complete meltdown. So it wasn't personal for us all over the country and possibly all over the world. Uh, people were 
looking at their screens in disbelief it wasn't just us and uh, I have to say I'm amazed and pleased by how quickly it came back and I'm even more amazed and pleased to see that the questions that you all have been typing in survived the crash so I still have them all which is excellent so if I, if I can ask all the panelists to turn their cameras back on so we can see you then I'll go through as many of the questions as I can. In some cases, people have asked on quite similar topics, so we'll group them together. Uh, I, Because the talks were so interesting, there's no doubt we will not get through all of them. But uh, while I'm not familiar with GoToWebinar backend, I have confidence that Landolinks, the organisers, will actually have a look at the questions afterwards. So we can work together and make sure if you don't get a, a verbal answer now, you will be getting some sort of response uh, after the event. So thank you very much for putting them all in. And I will start. Oh, having lost them all, that was clever. OK, so going back to the start. Uh, I'll, so Neil, Neil Davies, who, who was our first speaker, uh, I think you may have covered this, but it may be useful just to recap very quickly. It's a question from Roger Sexton, and the question is, what is the statutory basis of the bus service improvement plans, which are the central feature of the bus strategy? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, did touch on it briefly, but I think um, yeah, there currently is no additional legislation. So the statutory basis is what we've been working with from the Bus Services Act 2017 and the Transport Act. 2000. So it's nothing new. Um, the way the government is getting around this lack of legislation is using the lever of money. Um, it, it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's referred to, I think, three times in the MBS that um, if you don't play the government's game, that there's a threat that uh, funding could be withdrawn or reduced for even a sort of a bridge replacement scheme or a, uh, you know a new highway scheme that, that the authority might be wanting to, to bid for so they're not using legislation um, but they are using the other lever that they have to their to their uh, arsenal of um, money so I think that that's the sort of the key the key thing let's see what comes out in the the, the, the in the guidance uh, I just checked it's still not been issued so that's fine for this morning um, but I'm sure there will be more about what sort of the minimum standard uh, DFT are looking for in, in BSIPs um, but yeah not legislation but money that's the lever they're pulling. Great thank you very much for, for expanding on that so uh, secondly I have a question from John Carr and I'll direct that to, to Simon and uh, the question is, uh, local authorities and operators have worked closely together during the pandemic, and this gives a good base to open the EP conversations. The problems will come in political and highway mindsets focused on absolute freedom for the private car and current interpretation of network management is keeping vehicles, not people, moving. Will this be the Achilles heel? So what are your thoughts, Simon? So, um... I hate to say this, but from my experience at TFL, yes. Um, so and, until we can get the highways management also overseeing bus movement, and even, we're not going to get it so that they're thinking about per people. I, I just think that's a step a step further. It would be great, but it's a step too far. So um, until they're responsible for the reliability of the bus network, um, we're going to have a have an issue. And, and that was a shift that TFL was moving to with highways management also taking on responsibility of reliability of buses. But the, the that's going to be the key thing. If those services aren't reliable, then then there's not much point to having, like it's not better buses. But also as you, the better your buses are, the less people that are going to be relying on cars, um, although not all trips can be transferred. And therefore, the more people who can therefore rely on buses rather than cars, um, and as we know, there are some who will always rely on buses rather than cars because it's just not, they, they either can't afford it or there's no other, I mean, it's not feasible for them. So the more people that we can switch to the bus, the less cars there will be, and therefore the more traffic will flow better. So we just need that interpretation to be understood, but I think John is spot on. Thank you. Uh, I'm having some glitch here myself now. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, on this occasion is just this particular laptop thing. Okay, my, my next question I'll uh, direct to Claire, and it's a question from Ashley Weir, and it says, uh, for the past 12 months, all society messaging has effectively been portraying bus travel as the mode of last resort, as quite nicely put, and not to be used at all unless absolutely necessary. Uh, what are your thoughts on trying to change this narrative now? And uh, most importantly, if we're not lifting social distancing requirements, what are the chances of public transport being viable? So Claire, uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I leave the viability questions to, to the operators, but if we want a greener, fairer society, then we have to get people onto public transport. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a bus, as in a double-decker red bus. It can be a lot of different shared vehicles, including quite small shared vehicles. Um, and I think the green arguments are going to be the ones that might encourage the younger people um, to think about that argument. We've talked along and asked loudly for a way of actually being able to compare your cost and green uh, credentials of every journey in the same way that you can put a request in for a journey that tells you what the cheapest version is and um, we want to be able people be able to compare what the what the green cost is the carbon cost as well as the actual true cost which quite often doesn't actually um, come up when people are talking about the car journey they tend to conveniently forget about the cost of fuel the cost of maintenance the cost of insurance, the cost of everything else. Um, so they just don't factor that into their decision making because they think they've already made that choice. Um, but I do think it's vital that government messaging starts to be much more positive about bus companies, about bus travel. There's, there's a lot of nonsense talked about traveling on buses, mostly by people who haven't been on the bus since they were at school. And in most cases, they're my age, so it's a hell of a long time ago. So I would actually think one of the things I would love to see is local authorities requiring all councillors to attend all council meetings by public transport in their area, rather than having car allowances. And then they'd start to understand what the issues are in their local authorities with public transport. Yeah. Can I, can I uh, chip in very quickly yes, on that Carl. as well, Jenny? Um, yes, please, Carl. I, all, all it was was I did want to highlight that within the Bus Back Better document, there is a commitment from the government, which sounds certainly sounds very encouraging, to actually launch a national campaign called Back to Bus, which, if you believe the document says, it will promote the reformed network and address misconceptions, encouraging people to use the bus. So just to highlight that it is in there and it sounds quite encouraging. They even use the word we will rather than we might. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Actually, what they've committed to doing is to support the Confederation of Passenger Transport campaign rather than doing it themselves. So and the problem with having a bus operator campaign is there's an awful lot of people out there would, would go, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Whereas if right. it's government messaging, you may or may not believe it, but at least it's a more neutral environment. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, the next question is uh, definitely for Carl because it's uh, transport technology related and it comes from John Carr. And uh, John says that his guess is that outside London, 80% or more of roads have insufficient space for continuous bus lanes. So minor road improvements and innovative ITS are likely to be the main tools for most authorities. Uh, what works in London is often not achievable or too expensive elsewhere. So, Carl, uh, do you agree? Is, is, is technology going to be key to this? Well, I mean, that is an interesting area. Uh, strict, not strictly our area of expertise. We're more on the software and passenger information side. So I don't know whether you know, some of the other panelists may well have more input than, than I have, but my, my immediate thought is that there's talk about feeder routes in the strategy and there's of course the wider ambition to move away from regular scheduled services to an on-demand uh, service uh, and I think the strategy makes it clear that that would be a good substitute for times when uh, areas of lower density less frequent services so that's there to help um, but in terms of using technology 
to create additional infrastructure space well that, that's obviously impossible so we can we have to work with what we've got i think the key will be how we make it more efficient great thank you uh, we, we had a question on email uh, before the event, which I think I will uh, direct to Claire. It comes from uh, David Regwell, uh, who, whose email address rather nicely is Diversity David. So that's rather neat. And uh, David uh, is interested on the, in views on uh, disabled access to coaches and to buses. Uh, it's a very detailed question, but Claire, perhaps if you could if you could comment on uh, is there anything new in in the strategy uh, or is there are, do you have any concerns about how disabled access is going to be included into the future well i think coaches is the is the big issue here um uh, buses obviously buses in regular service have to be accessible by law now it doesn't mean they all are but they they do have to be so people can get in trouble for running buses that aren't um Coaches is much more of a problem, and there's been a reluctance um, on the part of the authorities to um, push something called the PSVAR, reg the regulations that basically say it has to be accessible. Now, it's kind of understandable that they don't want to stamp up and down on that um, because of all the monies lost by coach companies over COVID, um, but they've had 16, 17 years, really, of talking about this. Um, and it's not really fair on a obviously the passengers but b the coach operators who have actually invested the money in making sure their vehicles are accessible as, as well as best they can some vehicles are technically accessible but they're not actually that easy if you have multiple disabilities um or if you're unable to transfer easily from a wheelchair to a standard chair it's just not very um easily done um, but I think everybody needs to look at public transport as being for every member of the public. So if I was um, well, multiple, had multiple disabilities and I wanted to go on a journey, I don't really want to have to phone up a fortnight in advance to find out if the vehicle is right, if there's going to be somebody to help me. I just want to be able to travel independently. And that should be the same for every citizen, regardless if they're their disability is visible, is it they're a wheelchair user. It's not all about everyone else. You're supposed to look at the people. It's an omnibus after all. So that's supposed to mean for everyone. And let's make sure PSVAR gets pushed through ASAP and funding given for operators who can't afford it at the moment, rather than, well, they can't afford it at the moment, so let's not bother, never mind those people. It's not right. Th thank you, Claire. Uh, would either of our two transport planners on the panel like to give your perspective on this? Neil and Simon. Um, I think uh, Claire, Claire's right. Um, you know, scheduled buses, um, a lot of work's been done on that. Perhaps more needs to be done on the infrastructure side. So actually the bus stops and particularly in rural areas where, um, you know, if, if we are moving to a, a sort of demand responsive type network, that itself raises issues of accessibility. Um, not every vehicle is going to be able to get right to your front door or to the end of your drive. Um, and so there'll then be, you know, someone stood in a lane on a corner. Um, you know, it might be a convenient point for them, but it might not be accessible or it might not be safe as a pickup point. So there will need to be wider uh, considerations as the network changes. Uh, and obviously, within us, perhaps more urban areas and suburban areas, if new routes are introduced or amended, there will be a whole raft of uh, bus stop infrastructure that needs to be put back in. Um, the MBS does cover improved quality of timetable information at stops, so trying to ensure that actually you know, every stop has an up-to-date timetable in it with fares information. Um, the fares is always the one that everybody misses because it's commercially sensitive and it's a bit too difficult. They can change fairly quickly, but that's actually, in some ways, the cost is the one that people want to know more. Um, they, you know, they can see the bus going up and down the road, but how much does it cost? And if they can't see that, you know, th that's one aspect. And then it's making sure that also that information is accessible in all formats. Um, you know, the MBS also uh, mentioned timetables online are quite often out of date, or you do a Google search and the timetable that comes up is one that's from two, three years ago and isn't the latest one. So 
I think there's a lot of work you know, behind the scenes also on the information side, making sure that's accessible. And then it can support the point that Claire was saying about somebody being able to just turn up and travel there and then regardless of their ability. So it's, it is, there is more work needing to be done on the scheduled network. And then when we get to sort of the, the, the coaches and the like, that is perhaps a slightly different topic, um, but hopefully the, there'll be ripples of benefits coming out from improving it for buses. Simon, did you want to add anything to that? I think they've actually both covered that quite well. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And well, I will, I will go to Cos. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'll, I'll, guidance that they could look at as well from London would be the only thing. Thank you. Uh, Carl, uh, there was quite a lot of mention of data there. Uh, are there any specific aspects of, of uh, uh, obtaining the correct data in order to provide a, an, a, the best service to disabled travellers? Um, if I could start with FAIRS data, because that was what was on my mind very quickly from Neil, uh, just to point out that the good news on FAIRS data is I believe from January just gone, January to 21, it became mandatory to publish simple FAIRS data through the Bus Open Data Service, and I believe it's January 2023, or everyone will have to publish comprehensive fares data. So hopefully there's some light at the end of the tunnel there. Uh, and in terms of the accessibility requirements that you mentioned, my, my understanding is that it is mandatory to include vehicle accessibility information in the schedule and real-time data that's published to BODS. Uh, but I don't have a deep understanding of to what degree. I'd be happy to look into that if anybody's interested. Thank you very much. I mean, personally, I think the the compliance with the BOD, that's uh, perhaps worthy of a future webinar all, all, all on its own, if Land Links want to make note of that. I, I certainly would attend that with great interest. OK, so moving on, uh, we have uh, a question from Keith Homer, and he actually says it's a question to Neil Davis, so I'm not, not going to argue with that. Uh, <laughs> he says, uh, Neil, do you deduce that under an EP, I suppose that's meant to be, freedom of entry is restricted because the local transport authority and incumbent operators have a right to object to new service registrations, whether by operators that are already part of the EP or new entrants. And following on from this, how does a new entrant operator become a member of an EP if they weren't part of the so-called electoral college that established it? Neil. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, morning, Keith. Um, so because there's no new legislation underpinning this, we're working with existing frameworks. So uh, here in the West Midlands, we have advanced quality partnerships. And obviously there's uh, the Interlink partnership down in um, Hertfordshire, which is an, exist you know, an enhanced partnership. So we're working with an established process. Um, the whole ambition of MBS about improving the network and making it better, uh, changing links, making it a more usable network. I think a new entrant, I don't think there are any particularly onerous uh, barriers to entry, but it will be more about the new entrant proving that they're bringing something different to the network. So current head-to-head -head competition outside London where you know you have two operators trying to operate the bus every five, six minutes each just to try and get market share on the corridor. There's an undercurrent of um, that old word of cross-subsidy. I think we are heading back towards that of taking cost of the network, redistributing those resources and balancing that, that out against the, the revenue. So it's more about a new entrant coming in and proving that they've identified a gap that um, they want to fill. And I don't think it would then be fair for the uh, local authority to take that to sort of the existing operators and go, someone's identified a gap, here you go, you go and fill it. If that's an operator who has a license and registration, um, then I think, you know, that it's up for them to, to to prove that there is a gap that they can do um and and just sort of yeah fill that gap that they've identified so yeah there's no barriers to entry it's very much process that we're we're familiar with it's just proving that you can you can fulfill something that isn't just going to take revenue it's not it's not a sort of taking the cream off the top of the network it's that they, you can bring something new and i think that should then be able to be uh, allowed to come into the the partnership Lovely. Th thank you, Neil. Uh, now, moving on to, Jenny, to Simon. Sorry, sorry Jenny, could I just quickly um, 
as the chair of the West Midlands um, Enhanced Partnership Scheme, I'm sort of in a good position to say um, one of the things we were quite um, keen to establish was that this would not turn into some kind of cartel, um, which I think is a lot of uh, the behind a lot of the fear that some small operators have that they're somehow going to be edged out by the big boys wanting to have all the butter and all the cream. Um, and that's not been, certainly not my experience at all. Um, the Enhanced Partnership Scheme grouping was sent to everybody that we knew that we had a, a license in the area and they were invited to attend at, at the early stages, whether or not they had anything special to offer, frankly, they were just invited to take part in it. Um, so I do think it rather depends on how you frame this um, but in most cases, the local authorities don't really have any interest in um, just getting into the pockets of the big boys for this. The big boys might, but they're not going to get away with it. So, thank you. Um, I, I, should, I should have mentioned earlier, we, we are running uh, an extra 10 minutes so that people who didn't have an 1130 they had to go to uh, can, you know, we, we can give them the minutes that we, we stole from them with, with our crash. So I see quite a few of you are still on the call and thank you for bearing with us and it's great that you're still here. Uh, now, I'm, I'm making difficulties for myself here. Uh, question for Simon, uh, which Simon has answered in writing, but I suspect that only Simon, I and the questioner can uh, read that answer and it's a very interesting question. It's uh, good morning, it says, uh, given the decline in bus use in London after years of growth, which I agree was very sad when those stats started coming through, uh, what is the learning for other areas to maintain growth post pandemic? And the questioner is Kevin Farkerson, and I, I think I'm gonna have to plead the not uh, mother tongue English from birth card on that surname. So I'm very sorry, Kevin, if I, if I completely mangled it. But Simon, your, your answer is great. So if you would like to share it with the whole audience, please. Yeah, so sorry, I was I was answering some of the questions online because I was aware that we were running short on time. But um, so the growth in London um, was was before me, but I was made quite aware of it. It was um, it was as a result of firstly, Ken Livingston put bus lanes everywhere very quickly. Um, the anecdotally, it's overnight. I half believe that that actually happened. Um, the congestion charge came in, which made central London um, a far better space. And although everywhere's different to London um, in the world, basically, the that still applies in town centres and other places with this key congestion. Congestion zones are going to help with that. Um, operator incentive schemes were were key because it actually changed how the operators were were, were responding. Um, there was a lot of concessionary fares put in, which also increased growth suddenly. And um, now all of that was also at the time when there was a high investment. Um, and so when the when the government grant was cut to TFL, you start to see that decline start. When you see um, bus lanes start to be removed for other purposes, you see that that start to decline as well. And that's where you see that curve, um, curve coming in London, was reliability fell out, congestion went up. And um, a lot of that does focus more on central London and in London where, where a lot of that was occurring. Um, but, those what caused it. So as I put there, the most simple thing is if you want to maintain growth, you have to maintain reliability and that investment. And also by maintaining that reliability and the directness of services um, and battling that kind of the difference in, in journey time between car and, and bus, that's when you're going to also ensure that the services that are viable remain as viable as possible and start to generate the revenue to support the other services more. Great, thank you. Uh, it's 11.39. Can I just well, you will have to be super brief there. <laughs> Go on. Okay. One, one thing that wasn't mentioned about TfL crashing um, and its numbers was the fact that it coincided with the removal of cash acceptance on the public transport network. Um, and that made a massive difference to quite a lot of people and not least the the confusion. I could go on and on, but I won't because Jenny will shout at me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Claire and I work a lot together. We, we, we are friends, even though it may not sound that way. Uh, so it is very much time to wrap up. Uh, I have a request here from Peter Bramwell for the link 
to where to meet the DFT uh, fair, the DFT funding application deadline. So I think that was Neil. If, if whoever can put it in the chat, that'd be really, really helpful. And uh, yeah, it's the presentation which is coming around as well. So, uh, but yeah, I'll put it in the chat now. Great, lovely, thank you. And uh, the last one is from Tim Farrow, who has a, a very good suggestion for Landor. So uh, Landor organisers, I hope you're listening. He's suggesting that there could be a comprehensive national training event for LTA, LTA representatives. We're going back to the, the, the possible lack of skills and, and knowledge. And he's saying not just officers, but also councillors. Uh, I've attended some of the events along those lines that the DFT has run on bus urban data, and I think they're a great idea. So certainly I would volunteer to be part of that and maybe other people on the panel as well. So yeah. it is now time for me to thank all of you, Neil and Simon, Carl and Claire. Uh, you've been absolutely, in my opinion, absolutely fascinating and interesting to listen to. I hope the audience agrees. Uh, very much like to thank the audience, particularly since nearly all of you came back after our crash, and we really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Uh, please follow up afterwards. I know I didn't cover all the questions, but we will work with Landor to make sure that everybody gets some sort of answer. And too often it's forgotten uh, the people who've sat at the back end of this, particularly since they had a particularly stressful occurrence today. Uh, we appreciate what you do. We know it's not easy. We, we know us participants sometimes don't make it easy with our slightly silly questions and uh, substandard, in my case, substandard hardware. So thank you to the organizers as well. And very much to hope to see you at the next one. Thank you very much. Have a good day.